Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Blue Marble Desktop webinar for the month of September. Today we're going to be talking about a new tool that has just been released in version 2.5 of the Blue Marble Desktop. And this tool focuses specifically on deriving your own datum transformations. Uh, today's uh, webinar is going to uh, get fairly technical. Um, we're going to be uh, doing something that's uh, definitely in the advanced end of uh, the functions uh, available in the Blue Marble Desktop. Um, so as always, if you have any questions uh, during the webinar, uh, please feel free to use the questions tool, which is usually loaded up on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar screen. Um, you can use that questions tool to submit questions as we go along. I do have some other folks with me here uh, uh, helping out uh, answering questions during the session. And uh, towards the end of the session, uh, we will take a look at some of those questions that have come in throughout the hour and uh, address any uh, that are going to be applicable to everybody. And uh, if there's time at the end as well, we will uh, take some voice questions uh, as they come in uh, at the end. Um, so please feel free to use that questions tool uh, to submit any questions. Uh, if we are not able to get to your question during the session, uh, we will follow up with you afterwards and uh, get you the information you need. Uh, before we get going, I just would like to point out that today's webinar is actually being recorded, uh, as are all our webinars. And we can find those uh, recordings uh, available on our website. And this is a, our website page here. You can see the URL at the top of the screen uh, on our main webinar site. Uh, you can get a look at the upcoming webinar sessions that we have. Uh, we've already posted our topics uh, for next month. Uh, for the Blue Marble Desktop, we'll be looking at our administrative tools. And for Global Mapper, we will be taking a look at the new features uh, that will be coming out in uh, the, the new edition of Global Energy Mapper, a specific flavor of Global Mapper for the energy industry. As well, uh, the recording of today's session will be posted in our archive. And there's a link to that archive right at the top of our webinars page. Um, so you can click on that link and get access to all of our uh, previous webinars. These have all been uploaded into uh, YouTube video format. And they are available uh, for, uh, for viewing on demand. Um, so to get going with uh, today's session, um, we are going to be doing something very specific here on the, uh, on the derived datum shift function. This is a brand new function. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Blue Marble desktop and are, are brand new users, I'm going to give you just a very quick overview of uh, what, what the application does, uh, some of the different jobs, uh, because we are going to be focusing just on a very, very specific portion of one of those jobs. Uh, the application itself, uh, the Blue Marble Desktop, is the platform uh, through which all of our individual uh, conversion tools that we specialize in here at Blue Marble, uh, it is the platform through which we deliver all those tools. Uh, classically, we've had several separate applications over the years, uh, applications called uh, Geographic Calculator, which primarily focuses on numeric data conversion, vector data conversion, uh, point database conversions, things such as that. We've had uh, raster tools uh, for all the same types of functions. Those show up in our, our raster tools in the, uh, the bottom of the project manager list over towards the right. We've had tools that focused specifically on uh, vector data conversions as well, uh, very highly precise uh, transformations between various vector formats. Where these show up in the Blue Marble desktop are simply as individual jobs uh, that we can complete. Uh, we can set these up in a one-off mode or we can set these up in batches for very high throughput. Um, so just a, a really quick rundown here. For those of you who are, are new to the application, um, the interactive conversions job is a single uh, point conversion. This is for numeric data, basically one point uh, converting out to a point in another coordinate system, and tools for selecting uh, the datum transformation relating to different horizontal datums. This plays directly into what we're going to be doing today. Instead of using a predefined datum transformation, we're actually going to be deriving our own datum transformation based on control data. So we're, going, uh, we're basically going one step back in the process. Uh, point database conversions, which is where we're going to be uh, working today with a, a special function on the point database conversion, is where we handle uh, tabular data formats, things such as uh, uh, Microsoft Excel data, uh, new support uh, in this version as well. I'll just mention uh, quickly for the XLSX uh, format. That's uh, not a format we've been able to handle in the past. Um, so now you can handle both the, the older XLS format as well as the, the new XLSX format. 
Uh, the same types of functions are available here, in, except we're talking about the context of multiple coordinates. Down at the bottom of the interface, you'll see there are various calculations uh, that we can perform on this, uh, from conversion to forward and inverse calculations, which are uh, calculations relating to distance and azimuth uh, between points uh, across the surface of a datum. Uh, the best fit operation, uh, which we can use to uh, derive uh, coordinate transformations for local survey coordinate systems or engineering systems or plan systems. There are several names for this type of system. Sort of similar to what we're going to be doing today uh, with the uh, derivation of a custom datum shift, uh, except in that context, we're talking about non-geodetic uh, data. And uh, I recognize a lot of names on the registration list this morning. And I, I know there's a number of you that are familiar with uh, working in the best fit. So you're going to see a lot of similarities as we talk about deriving uh, geodetic datum shifts. Uh, there's just some slight language differences between there, but we're actually going to use a lot of the same application infrastructure uh, for this conversation. There is a, a very basic scale and translation tool uh, that as well can be used uh, as a, a sort of, uh, it's kind of an old school way of doing uh, coordinate transformations. Uh, we simply apply a coefficient and a translation factor uh, to stretch and skew uh, the data uh, that we have uh, numerically. And lastly, this brand new function that we have on the point database conversion job to derive a datum shift. So what we're going to be doing is focusing on a, a very particular piece of data uh, that I have that is control data. And what we're going to be doing is mapping up two, geode <coughs> excuse me, two geodetic coordinate systems. So that is, we have uh, two pairs of control data, one in a, uh, a system that is uh, sort of a common global system. The data we're going to be working with today is a combination of data in WGS84, and another system that is not particularly well understood in, in various uh, uh, parts of the world. It's a coordinate system that comes to us uh, from China, uh, the Beijing, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the Beijing 1954. Uh, coordinate system. Uh, what we're going to be doing is deriving our own datum shift for that based on uh, lat long control data. And so we're going to be coming back to that in, in just a second. And we're going to dive right into the deep end of the pool with today's webinar. Our seismic survey conversion is a special case of the uh, point database conversion job. Um, this is specially suited to seismic data formats. Uh, you'll notice a lot of the same infrastructure within the application relating to uh, coordinate conversion throughout the application. On each job, we have this central datum transformation box that we can use to relate uh, a coordinate system with an input datum to a coordinate system with a differing output datum. Um, in the case of having systems uh, that are both on the same datum, a transformation is not needed. There are some cases uh, around uh, the world where particular combinations of horizontal datums don't actually have a good transformation going between them. There's not one that is either publicly available uh, or simply the control work has never been done uh, to derive the transformation. So these, these transformations that we're going to be coming back to are going to percolate up through the application in all of the different types of data, whether it be here on the seismic data conversion job, on the vector data conversion job, uh, or on things like the vector, uh, uh, excuse me, on the raster uh, transformation job where we can georeference and process uh, into any other coordinate system uh, raster imagery. Uh, we also have jobs in here for tiling out of vector data as well as uh, raster mosaicing and the similar raster tiling job. Uh, so the various data conversion tools that are available uh, all throughout the Blue Marble desktop. And they're all built on this core of being able to process any coordinate system to any other coordinate system, either by means of things like a best fit transformation through a true projection, uh, converting from one projection to another, or uh, actually using a, a, a true datum shift. And so that's what today's session is going to be all about, this new uh, datum shift derivation job. The data that we're going to be looking at um, You'll see I've got a job already set up for myself uh, down in the special features area of the, of the desktop. In here I have a number of uh, specialty pieces of data that you've probably seen in some of our other webinars on various topics. So each of these jobs is just a, a specialized set of one of those uh, blank template jobs that I have at the top of my project manager up here. So at the top I have my base uh, job types, and at the bottom, I have put these together into uh, various uh, predefined jobs that I can use for, uh, for sake of uh, demonstration purposes. So we have every 
everything from seismic jobs to vector processing jobs. And similarly, you can use uh, the project manager to organize your work when you actually get into uh, setting up multiple uh, data conversions out here. So down in the bottom of this area, I've got a special job that I've named Derived Datum Shift. And this, as you can see, is simply a what we call our PDC job, our Point Database Conversions job. I've already loaded some data in uh, for this job, and this data uh, simply happens to exist as an Excel sheet. Uh, the incoming format of this is not particularly important. Um, what we really need here is just simply some tabular format of data uh, that you can load in with uh, two pairs of uh, coordinates, uh, basically control uh, points in both of the systems that you're trying to create a datum transformation in between. Now, for this example I mentioned, we have data uh, that goes from WGS84 uh, latitude longitude, and we're going to be uh, deriving a transformation to uh, the Beijing 1954 uh, coordinate system, also in, in latitude and longitude. The control data that I have on screen here, uh, both of my systems are actually geodetically based systems. That is, I have latitude and longitude for input and uh, my target system as well. Uh, that is not a requirement of this job. Uh, if you have projected uh, coordinate system information, uh, projected control points that were maybe gathered by a traditional uh, survey technique, you can also put in uh, uh, projected coordinates as long as they are geodetically based. That is, they have a horizontal datum at the core of that projection definition. Uh, for simplicity today, I'm going to be working just with our, our geodetic coordinates just to make things a little bit easier to make sense of some of the numbers that we're going to be looking at. So the order of the, uh, the table that we have as well is not uh, particularly important. We have, uh, in this case, uh, for just this example, we have uh, our WGS84 latitudes uh, and our longitudes ahead of the Beijing uh, coordinate system. Um, that could be the other way around. Um, the order of latitude and longitude themselves could actually be reversed in here as well. Uh, part of the process, for those of you familiar uh, with the point database conversion job, uh, is actually specifying exactly what column uh, contains each piece of data. Um, so where we take care of that is in our column settings uh, right underneath uh, the table as it's loaded in. So thus far, what I've done to set this job up uh, ahead of time is simply I've loaded in my Excel sheet, and I already set the coordinate systems. So for those of you new to the desktop, uh, the, the selection of the coordinate systems here uh, is uh, simply a process of double-clicking on uh, either our input or the output side. Um, the only importance here of which is on the left and which is on the right is going to control uh, the, uh, the direction of the transformation that we will be uh, deriving. So for this example, I have chosen to use WGS84 as my, my source coordinates and my Beijing 54 uh, coordinates as my target coordinate systems. So this, uh, this particular datum transformation will go in the direction of WGS84 to Beijing 1954. We could just as easily uh, go the other way if we wanted our, our definition uh, to be in the reverse direction. Once we derive that transformation, uh, we can actually go forward and reverse uh, in the application uh, with any type of data, and we'll, we'll see that in action a little bit later on. So to select the coordinate systems, on the left-hand side of the screen here, I have WGS84. Um, that is our default coordinate system. Um, so in that case, I didn't need to change that from the, the base settings that are in place on a blank job when we start. I needed to select uh, Beijing 1954. So the process to do that, for those of you new to the application, is simply to double-click on the, the blue box here labeled System on the output side. So I'm just double-clicking on that box. And up is going to come our uh, 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 coordinate system selection. The standard dialogues you're going to see in any Blue Marble tool uh, for selection of things like coordinate systems, uh, datum objects, uh, linear units, uh, and, and any geodetic object you're going to find in our parameter database. At the very top of the interface, uh, you'll see the main data source listed. Geodata XML, that is the include with the package out of the box. All of our predefined coordinate systems are stored in that database. It is uh, locked up and protected uh, from end user harm. Uh, we have
have various administrative tools for uh, governing what your end users uh, have available from that database. And that's actually going to be the topic of next month's webinar. So if, if you're interested in really getting the power out of uh, investigating uh, the Geodata XML and streamlining the use of that for your end users, you probably want to tune in next month. Uh, today's uh, session, we're going to be focusing more on that custom XML file. Uh, we're going to be creating a new datum transformation object in the data source, and that is going to be stored as a custom definition. Uh, so it's going to show up a little bit different uh, in our library as we go to store that. It's going to be uh, a collection of modifiable parameters. Uh, we can actually change the definition. Uh, we can assign custom names. We can move it around into different folders. And we can actually change its definition uh, once, we've, once we've derived it. So today's uh, example, again, is on Beijing 1954. So to find that particular coordinate system, I go down under my geodetic uh, family of coordinate systems. And then beneath that, they are all geopolitically organized. So we'll find uh, top-level folders uh, by continent. And then under each continent, we'll find uh, subfolders uh, of the particular geopolitical region. So in, in most cases, these are going to be by countries. And in, in some cases, they're large geographic regions. So this particular definition is a uh, Chinese-specific system. So we'll find that China folder. And in the China subfolder, you will see a collection of all of the particular coordinate systems found uh, in, in that subregion. So the one we're looking for here is Beijing 1954. Uh, if we want to make sure that that's actually based on the parameters we expect, we can simply right click on that and select View Info. This is going to open up the standard uh, definition dialog. Uh, any Blue Marble definition is going to have a similar dialog to this that outlines all of the parameters that uh, make that a coordinate system object, a, a definition, a unique thing. So in this case, it's based on the 1954 uh, Beijing coordinate system. The units are specified as uh, geodetic points in degrees. And as well, there's an envelope, uh, which is a, a geographic area of use, describing where that system is normally found on the planet. Under the identification section, this is where we can find any reference information, uh, so the, the name of the system. There may be remarks uh, for given systems based on uh, the EPSG database notes uh, for those. And then the identifiers uh, actually help us match this system up against uh, databases found in other locations. Things like the EPSG database, which is sort of our world standard uh, for uh, uh, coordinate location. Things like ER mapper codes, how they are referred to in ER mapper software. Uh, PRJ codes to allow you to match that up against uh, ESRI uh, database, uh, uh, the ESRI database of coordinate systems, that is, um, using their uh, uh, PRJ codes uh, found in uh, PRJ files. Uh, we're actually going to be coming back to that a little bit uh, because we're actually going to be writing this coordinate system uh, transformation out as a definition that can be imported elsewhere. And specifically, we're going to be using an example of an ESRI coordinate system format. Uh, to do so. So once we are confident that we have the right definition for our, uh, in this case, my target system, we just simply double click on it, or you can uh, select it and click the OK button in the upper right. That returns us back to the main screen. And so now at this point, we have our source coordinate system, and we have our target coordinate system uh, specified for our input data. And again, the, the input order of that does not really matter other than to control the direction of the transformation that we're selecting. Settings, this is really what gives uh, the job its, its backbone. This is where we tell it where each of the various inputs lives in the table. Uh, and it's where we control uh, all of the settings for the direction of that transformation. So uh, where our source coordinate columns are, where our target coordinate columns are, uh, selection of the shift method uh, that we're going to be deriving. Uh, we have a few different methods of datum transformation we can calculate here. And then our output columns, which are uh, going to calculate for us uh, some coordinates based on the transformation that we've created, as well as some residual errors, which are going to give us somewhat of an idea of the tightness of the uh, parameters that we're creating. Um, so let's just step through this uh, bit by bit as we go. So under the input side on the source coordinates, uh, we have, in this case, we're going to be deriving a shift in the direction of WGS84 to the Beijing 1954 coordinate system. Uh, very commonly, uh, we might be going the alternate direction. Uh, so the direction of your derivation here uh, is, is really up to your need. 
uh, for the, the parameters that you want to see for output. Uh, our geodetic latitude for our source coordinates is going to come from that WGS84 uh, lat column. And those column names, again, up here right in our data table. That's where I'm getting the names that we see in these drop downs here. So the geodetic longitude uh, for our source is going to be that WGS84 long column. My target coordinates are the system we're trying to end up in. So those are going to be my Beijing uh, 1954 latitude and Beijing 1954 longitude uh, coordinate columns. So we have our input and target uh, coordinate systems uh, uh, columns specified. Next up is the point use flag. And this is going to be a column that we need to add into the table. And this is going to act as a control mechanism for us for which pairs of coordinates are included in the overall model. So I'm simply going to add a new column in. This is an automatically uh, populated column. I'm going to just simply give it an abbreviated name here of uh, point use. And for those of you familiar with the best fit uh, operation, mapping up two engineering coordinate systems against each other, uh, this is going to function in a similar method uh, to the point use flag on, on that version of, of the calculation. So I'm going to add in a, a column name here, uh, the point use column, and I'm simply going to tuck it into my table after the last column. So this is going to show up uh, as I add this in after that Beijing 1954 longitude column. So you'll see my new point use column add, adds into the table there automatically. We'll come back to that, that column and its significance in just a moment. The shift method is going to govern the type of datum transformation that we're actually deriving between these two systems. So there's three methods uh, that are found in here uh, in, the, in this, which is the first version of this tool that we've released. We have geocentric transform, which is uh, also called a Molodensky shift or a three parameter shift. Those are uh, three similar ways of, of talking about the method. Um, what we're going to be deriving here is a shift of the, uh, the geocenter uh, between these two systems uh, in three directions. Uh, so it, for those of you familiar with geocentric coordinates, uh, those are where the axes uh, of the coordinate system are relative to the center of the planet, the geocenter of the planet, that is. So our z-axis is our polar axis, and our x and y axes uh, uh, radiate out from the geocenter on the equatorial plane with the x-axis coming out uh, where the equator intersects with the chosen prime meridian uh, and the y-axis also coming out at the equator uh, 90 degrees uh, offset uh, from the, uh, the prime meridian. So those are the, the three axes we use in the geocentric uh, transformations. Uh, so we're going to be uh, shifting the geocenter uh, along those three directions. And that's going to come back to us as we take a look at the geocentric residuals a little bit later on. In uh, coordinate frame rotation and position vector rotation, these are a little more complex methods. They are both uh, seven parameter uh, transformation methods, for those of you familiar with that terminology. Uh, within seven parameter uh, transformations, there is a very important designation uh, between the standards of those. Uh, and the simple definition here, uh, without spending too much time on it, is that uh, there are rotation parameters uh, between uh, the, two, uh, the two systems. And those rotation uh, parameters are simply equal and opposite. Uh, so coordinate frame rotation uh, comes up with the same shift. Uh, it's simply going to be the rotation parameters go in a different direction than position vector rotation. And depending on what software uh, you are working with uh, or how you wish to uh, note these, uh, uh, in, in you know, if you need to publish them or share these parameters with other folks, uh, various uh, places, various databases, various other software tools specify their transformations sometimes as one or the other of these. So that, that's why uh, the, the reason for the two separate seven parameter methods, uh, simply to accommodate the system that you need to take these parameters off into. Um, so we're going to start off with a simple geocentric transformation. And then we'll, uh, we'll run that through, take a look at the, uh, the shift that comes up. And then we'll come back and, uh, and run that through instead as a seven parameter. We'll see how our, our results change a little bit. Over on the output side of the job, uh, we're going to be calculating uh, what we call adjusted coordinates. So the first step of this is to actually uh, calculate a transformation from our source system, WGS84, to a target system, in this case, Beijing 54. 
what we're going to do as a step of this, just as a simple uh, quality check, is to automatically calculate uh, some new Beijing 54 uh, coordinates from our source coordinates. So we're going to derive this transformation, then we're going to immediately apply that uh, to a test calculation. So we're going to recalculate our control points uh, in the Beijing 54 system. Uh, so you'll notice I've run out of columns in my table, so I'm simply going to add in uh, some uh, calculated uh, columns, some new columns here, and I'm, I'm going to just abbreviate these names. I'm going to call uh, my, my latitude column uh, my calc lat column, and I'm going to tuck that in at the end. I'm going to add in a calc long column that will fall in place uh, behind my, my new latitude column. And the height uh, for that, uh, in this case, I am simply only working with a two-dimensional transformation. Um, so I am uh, going to uh, add in a, a, a new height here. We may see some, uh, some surface shift between those two. And I'm going to call that calc height. There's my three new output columns uh, for uh, our predicted coordinates of those Beijing 54 locations uh, from our, our uh, datum transformation that is going to be used to transform from WGS84 uh, to the Beijing 54 system, just for comparison once we're done. The geocentric residuals are, uh, we've, we've talked about the transformation that we're uh, going to be deriving here is going to be a shift of the geocenter along the three geocentric axes. Therefore, the residual errors that we have here are going to be in each axis uh, relative to that, that system. So we're going to have uh, three linear uh, residual errors for each of those controls, depending on how well that control network meshes together uh, into a common uh, mathematical model uh, to shift in between those two systems. So we're going to end up with uh, hopefully small errors that are going to be given for us in these three linear directions, and they're going to be given to us in meters. And what I'm going to do is add in uh, new columns for those as well. And just as easily, you know, if you're setting up your control data in Excel, you could actually uh, enter in placeholders for these uh, from the beginning, or you could do it at this step. It doesn't really matter. That's a, that's a workflow decision that's, uh, that's up to you. Um, so I'm going to add in new columns here for my X error, a new column for my Y error, and lastly, a new column for my Z error. And as I add those, you'll see that each of those populate in my table as well. Uh, lastly, the name field at the bottom of this can be used to create a customized uh, name for the datum transformation that we will see uh, in the database. I'm not going to worry about this at this point. Uh, if you leave the name field blank, uh, there will be an automatically generated name that is usually descriptive enough uh, for you. It's going to include the name of the source system and the target system uh, correct with the direction uh, that you are deriving this transformation in. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave that blank and take the automatically generated name for me. Uh, since there are a number of columns in here similar to the best fit operation, it's a good idea just to give this a final once over to make sure everything has been added in the right place. Uh, if we do anything like uh, swapping the, say, the latitude and longitude columns on one of these, we're going to see some funny results. Our, our datum transformation would not uh, come up with valid parameters, so it's, it's always a good idea just to, just to give these a quick double check before we OK the settings. OK, so our, our settings are in place here. Um, we're ready to, to fire off our, our calculation. Um, we have set up our coordinate systems for our source and our, our target of this uh, datum transformation derivation. Uh, we have specified the operation as a uh, datum shift derivation here on the bottom of the screen. And we set up our column settings uh, to make sure that all of the columns are in line uh, for, the, for the conversion here, or rather for the calculation. I'm going to go down and hit the Calculate button. And you'll notice the process manager down at the bottom uh, pulls up a, a quick progress bar. Uh, this is a, a very quick calculation, so it shouldn't take long uh, to, to run unless you have an extremely high number of control points. And, and by high number, I mean many thousands, which is probably going to be unusual for, for this type of calculation. So as, uh, as the output of that uh, comes out in the table, 
uh, you'll see we have some calculated latitudes, longitudes, and heights uh, in there in our output system. Uh, we have a calculated uh, x, y, and z uh, residual error. And again, those are given to us in uh, meters of geocentric uh, coordinate axis direction. And in the center, you'll notice uh, that we now have a coordinate transformation name. We have uh, the automatically generated name of WGS 1984 to Beijing 1954. It uh, automatically takes the names of both of those horizontal datums involved in the shift. And it says new datum shift, uh, indicating that this has just been derived rather than uh, being a pre-existing uh, shift from our library. So the first step of this is to do a little bit of quality an analysis of just how close we are, both in our calculated outputs, uh, theoretically here, our calculated latitude and longitude. Uh, ideally, they would identically match our control data. But such is the way of uh, you know, a real world data, we are always going to see a little bit of slop in between those. So the ideal here uh, would be to compare those numbers, make sure we're coming down uh, very close to the same part of the world uh, with our predicted locations for those Beijing 54 coordinates. Uh, we might want to save this sheet off as uh, back out of, say, an Excel sheet. Uh, we could do some statistics on those if you wanted to get really uh, advanced with these. And then as well, the x, y, and z errors, uh, there are a lot of numbers there to look at as we uh, you know, scroll up and down through our, uh, through our table. Um, any individual number here doesn't really necessarily have a whole lot of meaning for us as we you know, see sort of the, the forest of numbers that are coming back at us. So this is a, a place very similar to the best fit uh, calculation, for those of you familiar with that, where we can make use of our display error plot tool. If we uh, open up our error plot, what this allows us to do is to visualize uh, the location of each of those uh, control points that we have in uh, the system here. So we have uh, the, the point locations uh, stored in our WGS84 uh, locations. As we scroll around the map here, you'll see the cursor positions at the, at the top of the screen. And as well, you'll see some vectors uh, coming off of those points. These vectors are rendered for us on screen to help indicate uh, the direction and magnitude of some of the slip uh, between these two uh, systems as we translate from our uh, source coordinate system, in this case WGS84, to the Beijing 54 system. So we're basically comparing uh, the actual uh, location of our control data against the predicted location of our, our output in Beijing 54. Similar to the best fit operation, uh, we have the uh, root mean square error uh, for the case getting a very, very small number. This is a very small fractional number. Um, and this is because we've got you know, uh, data here in, in terms of uh, the, the matching of these, these two control sets. This is, uh, I will admit, this is some synthetic data uh, that we have made uh, from uh, existing transformations. And so we're coming up here with a, with a very, very tight model in between those. The exaggeration factor allows us to uh, indicate uh, just how much we're multiplying uh, these vector tails that come off of each of those points, indicating uh, the magnitude of the error. Uh, what we do is simply scale those up to a point where the, the, the longest tails will mean something visually to you. Uh, in the case of having uh, uh, an error in some of the control data, uh, we might see some of those tails heading off in directions that are dissimilar uh, from the rest of those, indicating that there's something different about one of these points. Uh, maybe it was uh, poorly collected uh, uh, based on a, uh, say, a low accuracy uh, GPS uh, feed uh, for a particular moment, or maybe something simple like a transcription error in simply writing down uh, or copying over those control points. That gives us the residual max. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a very, very small number uh, in, uh, in meters here, uh, indicating we've got a, a very uh, tight fit uh, between these, uh, sort of on the, the large scale of the, the regional area that we're, we're looking at here, several degrees wide. And it tells us how many points are used in the solution. So in this case, we're using all 30 of the control points that I had uh, just added into the system. If we select on any one of those points, uh, you'll see that point uh, highlight and flash quickly. And then in the selected features area, 
it's going to give us a readout of all of the specific error information uh, for that point. Uh, so it's going to give us the, the calculated location as well as the residual errors for that particular point. Um, so in this case, we're seeing we've got some, some errors of a few meters uh, in this transformation, which is a, you know, a fairly uh, reasonable uh, error in, in terms of the geographic area that we have here of several degrees of, of uh, area on the ground. Um, those residuals uh, basically combine for us uh, to, uh, to give us an overall sense of the accuracy of this coordinate system. What I'm going to do here, just real quickly, to give us an idea of what happens when something in here uh, doesn't go quite right, I'm just simply going to tack on a bad coordinate. So I've just added uh, uh, two-tenths of a degree uh, to one of my control coordinates. As I calculate that transformation, you'll notice we get very different uh, residual errors. Uh, as I visualize that in the error plot, uh, suddenly our, our errors get a lot larger and our exaggeration factor gets a lot smaller. That typically indicates that there's a, a problem with some of our data. In this case, uh, with those error tails all disappearing uh, and getting you know, in, uh, much, much smaller in terms of the exaggeration factor, that tends to indicate that one of our points, in this case the, the first point in the table that I've, I've just uh, manipulated to make, uh, to make a bat point out of it, it has its own tail. Uh, basically nothing else here has a tail. This one point has a tail. And as well, if we examine uh, the, the, the residual errors at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice that we have a very large uh, X error associated with this point. That's a very quick way uh, to find things like those transcription errors or simple typo errors. Um, as well, if you have uh, control data that has a real significant outlier, uh, we will tend to see these individualized points uh, kind of heading off in their own direction, uh, different from the trends of the rest of those control points. So if uh, we then wanted to eliminate, uh, say, a bad control point from our network, this takes us back to that point use flag. Uh, if we were not able to reconcile what the proper control point should be, maybe we want to eliminate that from the system. So we would go over to the point use uh, flag and uh, change that from a 1. Uh, this is a, a basically a simple binary column. Uh, anything containing a 1 will be used in the model. Anything containing a 0 will not be used in this model. Uh, so we just change that uh, controller there to a 0, recalculate our model, and then the error plot for us will change to indicate uh, that that point is no longer being factored in uh, to the, the error plot. And as well, it's going to show us that only 29 of our control points have been uh, selected for use. Uh, still, it's going to show that large error because it is uh, completely an outlier uh, from this data set. If we could then actually figure out what the error with that is, you know, if we could correct our input data or gather a better control point, we might want to bring that back into the model, and it's just as simple as toggling that back over to a 1 in the point use column and recalculating our parameters. And we'll see all of those residuals drop back down into the, the smaller uh, ranges where, where we were kind of expecting them to be. So we'll see our error plot go back to normal. We have the very large exaggeration factor and the very low uh, root mean square errors associated with these. And as well, we see all of those uh, the vectors kind of trending in towards the, the center of, of the projection. Um, that's indicating for us that uh, you know there is sort of a, a systematic uh, uh, slip uh, within the area of the coordinate system. And since all those vectors are headed in the same direction, that really is kind of a kind of a good thing. Uh, it's when we start seeing stuff go off in their own direction uh, that we might want to get a little bit worried. But this is going to give us an idea of uh, the, the direction of inaccuracy uh, we're going to have uh, as we uh, actually apply this to real data sets. Uh, so in the, in the case of our uh, data out towards the edges of the area of this data, we're going to be seeing a little bit of slip, uh, probably a little farther out uh, than, uh, than we would intend to be from the center of this, uh, this coordinate system area. Uh, once we have uh, sort of a very nice trend with all of our points, uh, maybe an error uh, systematically heading in the same direction, a uh, very low exaggeration factor, a uh, very low, or excuse me, a very high exaggeration factor, very low root mean square, and a very low residual max, uh, we might then uh, be satisfied with the transformation that we've derived here. So our shift, we might decide this is ready for production. 
And so if we want to see what the parameters actually are that we've derived, all we need to do is right-click on that coordinate transformation box in the center of the interface where it indicates the name of our, our new datum shift. And you'll see we have a couple of options. We can view the details, and that will bring up our definition dialog to allow us to actually visualize uh, the, the numbers that are calculated in this shift. Uh, and we also have the option to export that out as a GTF file. And, uh, we're going to do one of these, and then we're going to do the other just so we can see what they both do. So I'm going to view the details of my new system. And you'll see a uh, box pops up here. This is our, one of our standard definition dialogs. And we can see the, uh, the source and target of this datum shift. Uh, down at the uh, middle there, we have the method. So we chose uh, excuse me, geocentric translation for our method. And then we see the actual parameters uh, involved in the shift. So we calculated an x, y, z shift uh, for this uh, uh, datum to relate it uh, from WGS84 to Beijing. So we control all of the, uh, the parameters in here through that control data. We can then take that three parameter shift. Uh, we can take a look at the remarks. We're going to auto-populate those uh, residual errors uh, along with the, uh, the, the datum transformation definition itself. Uh, we could also give it some identifiers if you wanted to give this uh, maybe your own internal name, if you're going to give this a uh, if this is to be entered into perhaps a proprietary database that you're using uh, throughout your organization uh, to, uh, to recognize that uh, in, in your own database if you do have unique codes like that. Uh, the name of that object uh, is simply saying new datum shift up there. Uh, we could uh, punch in a uh, you know, more meaningful name uh, than that if we would like to. We're also going to uh, be able to actually edit the parameters uh, for that if we go down under the data source menu and get into the datum tra uh, transformation uh, definitions. In here, you'll see I've got a, a couple of these extra ones. I've done a few different calculations. Uh, we can get into uh, each of those. Uh, in practice, um, you would uh, simply want to uh, delete some of those uh, uh, placeholders that we've done. I've uh, done a few different calculations here as so we've changed our settings. We might actually want to go in and give those some valid names uh, for, the, for the transformation. And as well, uh, the definition, if you wanted to simply round off uh, some of these to simplify your parameters, you would have the option of editing those parameters if you didn't want to carry it out to quite so many decimal places um, and uh, you know, slightly lower uh, the accuracy. Sometimes uh, the, uh, the, the precision of the datum shift uh, has to uh, uh, balance a little bit here with uh, uh, ease of publication. So you can actually modify those parameters if necessary. Uh, we can modify the name and the remarks of any of those. Once you have uh, names appropriately set in there, we do have the ability to permanently save that into your database. So you can call these up at any time um, within the Blue Marble desktop for conversion once these are in here. As well, these, you'll notice, go to the top level folder of data transformations. If you would like to move these, all you have to do is simply drag and drop these into a, an existing folder. And it can go in any of those uh, folders in the tree at any level. It doesn't have to be a top level uh, folder or anywhere uh, in particular. Uh, so with, uh, with those transformations, they you know, do permanently exist in the data source if you wish. Uh, if you close the application without saving these, they will disappear. Uh, but you will be prompted before that happens. In this case, I'm going to continue on uh, without saving the whole thing uh, because we are uh, just sort of messing around with these. They will remain active uh, during the session, and you can always go back and, uh, and save them later on. Uh, but I'm going to uh, just real quick here return back out to our, our main interface, and I'm going to use my other right-click option here. I'm going to choose to export those parameters out to a GTF file just so we can see what those are all about. Now, a GTF file is an ESRI-specific uh, uh, format, and that stands for Geographic Transformation File. Um, so what this is going to contain is a description uh, in a, a format. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, the PRJ format that's used extensively uh, in uh, exchanging uh, coordinate system definitions uh, throughout uh, ESRI and many other software packages uh, as well, uh, we're going to be able to take these GTF files and uh, use them off in ESRI if you wish to apply a datum shift uh, in, say, an ArcMap project uh, that you have derived from this custom data. Um, 
I'm just simply going to retain my uh, default name there. You would probably want to give this a, a little more meaningful name. And I'm just going to write this out to the desktop of the machine I'm, I'm working on just for easy access. Um, so I'm going to save that file. I'm going to minimize my Blue Marble desktop. And we can see the, the datum shift that I've just created there. I'm just going to pop this open in a simple text editing application uh, so we can see what's taking place in there. And we can actually see all of the specific uh, transformation parameters uh, fully described uh, in this standard uh, GTF file format. Um, so we can uh, directly uh, take this uh, GTF file off to uh, Esri-based software uh, and apply this uh, datum transformation into uh, projects from there. Or, uh, like I said before, any other application that also supports that uh, datum transformation uh, standard of GTF. Uh, and uh, real quick here, before we wrap it up, I'm just going to quickly show the significance, again, of the shift methods. Uh, we have been working on a three-parameter transformation so far. I'm just simply going to toggle that over to a coordinate frame rotation, uh, seven-parameter datum transformation. I'm going to OK those settings. So basically, we're going to be deriving a different type of datum shift here. All we have to do is recalculate. And when we do that, in this case, we're going to notice that there is a much lower uh, collection of residual errors. In our error plot tool, we're going to notice that our exaggeration factor has gone way up, and our residual, uh, uh, excuse me, the root mean square error for this model has gone uh, way, way down uh, as well. Uh, the directions of the errors that we see throughout the area here, uh, the tails uh, do sort of trend in some various directions. So you can see we do have a nice uh, sort of clean model here. Uh, some very uh, generalized trends of the, the errors uh, tending out uh, at the top, uh, trending uh, in uh, toward the, the middle in the bottom there. Uh, in the center, we've got a, a pretty pretty small magnitudes of some of those errors. Uh, but the overall root mean square of this is a uh, very, very small uh, value. So indicating that we probably do actually have a, a better collection of uh, datum transformation parameters uh, for this particular control set. And for this data, I'm, you know, I'm not really surprised about that, because it does cover sort of a larger area. And seven parameter methods uh, tend to be more useful uh, over large regions uh, than, say, the three parameter uh, geocentric method. So there's, there's definitely a lot to uh, uh, the background knowledge as you're uh, uh, creating some of these. This is a, a function. Uh, you, you do definitely need to be a little bit educated on uh, uh, the, the process of uh, proper control data uh, for creating these. Uh, we have intended here to make a, a tool that's very simple to use. Uh, we can get back in there to see the parameters now of our new uh, seven parameter uh, shift automatically all filled out for us there on the identification. Again, we can see those uh, those combined residuals of uh, some fairly small errors here. So we're down less than a, uh, a meter of error uh, throughout the uh, uh, control area. Um, so we've we've tried to design a tool here that is very simple to use uh, for what really is a very powerful calculation. Uh, so along with that, um, you do need to be uh, a little aware of the possibilities of, uh, of what you're doing here. Um, you can uh, create datum transformations that are entirely inaccurate. You supply uh, you know, bad control data. You don't have a, a good grasp of what those residual errors uh, are really representing to you in terms of the, uh, the overall accuracy of the, of the parameters. Uh, it, is, it is very simple here to uh, derive a data transformation that, uh, that simply is inaccurate if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so I would encourage uh, the, the use of this uh, with care. Uh, if you are at a, uh, a particularly large organization uh, where you have, uh, say, a, a staff geodesist or a that is in charge, uh, maybe a surveyor that is in charge of internal parameters. Um, they can uh, hopefully guide uh, the, the use of, of this tool for you a little bit. Um, I would definitely encourage um, anybody interested in, uh, in training uh, on, on this tool uh, to get in contact uh, with our sales team, to see if you uh, uh, can find a good opportunity uh, to get up to speed on some of the background of, of what's going on here in the data transformation. Uh, but uh, that is the, uh, the new datum transformation derivation tool. Uh, what I'm going to do here is pop open our interface and see if we've had any, uh, any questions come in uh, throughout the hour. Uh, doesn't look like we've uh, uh, 
got a, a whole lot of questions coming in. Um, there are just a, just a few coming in uh, that are you know, uh, definitely getting into uh, some of the specifics here. I, I think we've definitely got some, some geodesists in the audience uh, asking some questions today. Um, first question uh, that, I, uh, that I see right off out there is, uh, what are the, uh, the, the units involved in the residual errors? Um, so just real quickly, I, I probably went through that a little quickly at the beginning. Uh, under the column settings on the geocentric uh, residuals, uh, we see those in the x, the y, and the z direction. Those are our geocentric uh, coordinate axes. Uh, those, uh, by default here, are specified in meters uh, as we uh, are, are working in those units. Um, so we're, in, in the case of the practical data that we've fed in there, we are looking at uh, uh, errors. Uh, I'll just use one of our real examples here. So that first uh, X error is actually 0.233 meters. Uh, so we're looking at about 23 centimeters on that particular uh, residual point. Um, those are also, again, filled in for us on the details of those uh, the transformation parameters that we generate. So you will see uh, meters uh, being tagged on the end of those, uh, those shifts. Uh, we use meters for these because that is uh, sort of the uh, scientific and geodetic standard uh, for publishing uh, these, these shifts. So that's, that's why you're, you're seeing meters in there. Um, again, uh, the x, the y, and the z uh, axes, those are our geocentric axes. Uh, for those of you not familiar with, uh, with that terminology, um, you can read about uh, geocentric uh, coordinate systems. And that might uh, get you up to speed a little bit uh, uh, more quickly. Uh, but we are talking about Z uh, being the polar axis, uh, the X and the Y axis uh, being the axes on the equatorial plane. And, uh, uh, and, and basically that's it. Those are, those are the three simple axes. Uh, axes that we're going to be using to uh, do our shifts around the geocenter of, of these systems. Uh, another question coming in about the accuracy, uh, the overall accuracy, what is possible uh, throughout these. And that is, uh, that, that, that's sort of a very complicated question. Uh, but the accuracy of these is going to vary uh, drastically depending upon the quality of your input control data. Um, so in this case, um, I, I mentioned that well, I do have synthetic data here. So this is, this is data that we have actually uh, uh, made up from known good uh, transformation parameters just to, to give us a good example of a, a wide area. Um, in general, if we are considering uh, geocentric transformations of, uh, of simple uh, three-parameter shifts, the accuracy of those uh, uh, has the, the capability uh, and this is, you know, this is not a hard and fast rule. It's going to depend directly on the data you input. Um, it is going to depend directly on uh, the size of the area uh, that you're dumping into it. Um, three parameter shifts don't particularly well handle uh, large regional models. Uh, they're not well suited uh, to uh, things that are, say, continent sized. Um, if you try and stretch out even very high accuracy control data across a continental wide area, um, you're going to see uh, some. Uh, you're, you're going to see some very large errors out out on the orders of, you know, 50 to 100 meters of error. Uh, if you're working with seven parameter transformations and you have you know good high quality data, you do have uh, you know better chances of of getting a, a a highly accurate transformation that will cover a large region. Um, those are just simply some possibilities. Uh, that is not a hard and fast rule. Uh, a seven-parameter uh, transformation is not going to be, uh, you know, guaranteed uh, to be uh, high accuracy to any to any stretch. Um, it's going to depend purely on the quality of your your input controls, uh, and as well comparing that against the size of the of the region. Um, another question coming in about time-dependent transformations, uh, specifically, can HTTP transformations be created? Um, that's, a, that's definitely a little bit of a complicated question. Um, HTTP in particular, uh, for those of you outside the US, um, HTTP is a transformation method that we have here uh, published by our National Survey Authority, the, the National Geodetic Survey here. Um, it is a time-dependent transformation. And that is, it is capable of creating transformations uh, between uh, two epochs uh, of, of data as well as between uh, reference frames. Uh, so it is a, it's a software toolkit here published by the government um, that is a, a very highly accurate uh, transformation package. And uh, it is uh, both 
uh, spatially sensitive as well as being temporally sensitive. Uh, the, the transformations that we can uh, derive here uh, with our, uh, this, which is the first version of this calculation that we have, uh, the transformations that we can see here uh, are typically going to be a, a, a spatial horizontal uh, transformation. Uh, time is not necessarily a factor in these. What you can do is if you have uh, uh, data from two specific uh, epochs and you need to model uh, the change uh, taking place between those two epochs, uh, you could uh, derive a uh, what would be referred to as like a fixed epoch transformation. So it would be accurate uh, for a specific period of time uh, in uh, two different systems. Um, a common example of that uh, for here in North America might be uh, the transformation between, uh, say, NAT83, uh, the National uh, Survey Coordinate System, and, say, WGS84 or ITRF. Uh, if you had control data relative to one of each of those uh, at the same epoch, uh, you could uh, derive the horizontal portion of that shift um, and apply that for similar data uh, in those two epochs. Um, for the most part, uh, if you are in an area covered by HTTP, uh, most of the common reference frames are going to be already supported uh, by that toolkit, which is a very advanced uh, toolkit. Uh, you do have access to that uh, through the Blue Normal Desktop, so I, I would probably steer you uh, towards uh, simply using the HTTP uh, transformation itself. Uh, if you have uh, systems that fall outside of the models uh, covered, um, I, I would um, I would encourage you to uh, uh, to maybe give this a poke. And uh, you know th this is probably a, a pretty advanced conversation, so I would uh, definitely uh, encourage you to give us a, a, a give us an email or uh, give us a call into the the tech support department, and uh, we we may be able to to help you a little bit uh, farther along. Um, with the, uh, uh, with the particulars of those. Um, I've got just a, a couple more here I will uh, wrap up with here. Um, one is, let's see here, can heights be included in the computations? Um, we are able to uh, model the heights in there as well. Um, the, the transformation shift between there, uh, you specifically asked about uh, mean sea level. Those are not going to be uh, well modeled uh, in the types of datum transformations here, the three and the seven parameter. Um, uh, specifically, the uh, ellipsoid heights would be most compatible uh, with this with this type of transformation. Um, you can specify a vertical coordinate system uh, for both input and output, um, but uh, that that would uh, mainly be limited to ellipsoid height uh, for the for the calculation. But um, that that is possible uh, to derive a, a three parameter uh, or rather a three D shift, um, and and you'll see that as evidenced on the residual error statement. Um, in the remarks uh, derived for each of those, you will see an X, Y, and a Z. So this is a 3D transformation. Um, lastly, um, some upcoming uh, uh, industry events. Uh, I've got a shout out here from the APSG uh, that the, uh, the APSG fall meeting is coming up in Houston. Uh, we will see some of you folks down there. I, I recognize a few names that are attending today. Uh, so if you want to uh, actually talk to us down there, I, I believe we will have some folks uh, attending the APSG meeting. Uh, and as well, uh, another upcoming uh, industry event, uh, we will uh, we will be attending the G to Pipeline show. Um, so if you've got some uh, particular questions, uh, maybe some some data that you want to uh, try taking a look at with us, uh, you can come and visit our folks who are going to be attending the G to Pipeline show in Houston, uh, which is uh, the end of October. Um, I believe that's the week of the 22nd, if I if I remember that properly. Um, I would like to simply thank everyone for uh, for attending uh, today. And uh, if you have any questions, again, uh, please feel free to follow up with our uh, tech support um, uh, department uh, if you've got any questions. Uh, and uh, we can uh, see what we can do for you. Uh, so again, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hope to see you next month, uh, where we'll be talking about the administrative tools uh, found at Blue Normal Desktop. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.